So love is a competitive strategy. Love's a pretty big world, a, big, a pretty big word in our world. So as a point of clarification out of the gates, what we're referring to with love is deep valuing and deep connection, a profound sense of connection. And Jason and I are going to share some of our journey to get to love as a competitive strategy and then invite you to ask questions about where are you at on your learning edges of what we're talking about and create a space for a bit of dialogue and a little bit more on the how and why of love as a competitive strategy. Thanks, Robin. So I'm going to try and get by with the gym voice. So um, hopefully that works out. Everyone good so far? You can yes. hear me? Okay, great. You know, I won't lie, when I was um, earlier this morning when we were going over some things and, um, and I was looking at this topic, uh, I had a chuckle because if my 24-year-old self was sitting at the back of this room, <laughs> he would, um, he'd have something to say about this, right? At a coaching conference referred to as a festival, using the word sport, energy, and consciousness, talking about love, <laughs> right? It just wouldn't be my world. But... It hasn't always been that way. My Olympic journey began, like so many I'm imagining, young boys and girls who have a childhood dream. And uh, I was no different. At the age of six or seven, I met an Olympian, a rower. His name was Neil Campbell. And he rode for Canada at the 64 games in Tokyo and the 68 games in Mexico. And he sat in the stroke seat in the Canadian men's eight. And if you don't know anything about rowing, the guy who sits in the stroke seat sits at the front. He sets the rhythm, the pace. It's a tough seat. And in Mexico, Neil was 38 years of age. And it wasn't because they couldn't find anyone else, right? <laughs> he was just that good. He was that tough. He was that mean. Neil would go on to become a rowing legend internationally. He would be awarded the Order of Canada, which is the highest civic award in our country. And he would be someone who had a huge influence on my life. To describe Neil, he was a John Wayne character. And I know I'm showing my age a bit. <laughs> Which essentially meant that he was larger than life. He was charming, charismatic. He walked into a room and people noticed. The first time I rode for Neil, I was 16 years of age at a school in southern Ontario called Ridley College. It was grade 11, and it was amazing. Neil was amazing. Like so many boys, I idolized him. That man walked on water. My relationship with him was complex, like so many athletes and coaches. I respected him, I admired him, I trusted him, I feared him, I loved him. Of all the things that Neil taught me, and there was a lot, one of the biggest takeaways was that he taught me how to win. Rowing for Neil in high school, I won a lot of international championships. But he utilized what he had been taught which was a combative mindset, right? Essentially that meant that in Neil's world, in my world, rowing for Neil, a rowing race was a war. The course was a battlefield, our competition were the enemy, and our job was to kill them. And that's not a stretch. Anything to win. 
And it worked. It worked really well. After high school, I garnered a scholarship to a big U.S. school. Using that strategy, I got invited out to the west coast of Canada to try out for the national team. That strategy got me on to the national team. And then ultimately, that strategy got me into the top boat, the Canadian men's eight, sitting in the starting gates of an Olympic final. It worked. <coughs> Just to pause there and back up, four years before that Olympic final, Neil had coached the Canadian men to an Olympic gold in Los Angeles, where they set an Olympic record time. I was sitting in a boat with those Olympians and a few other new guys. Our job, expected, was to defend that Olympic title and win. Less than six minutes after the starter's command, we finished the, or we finished the race and crossed the line in sixth and last position, or DFL, as we used to call it. As if we needed reminding, the Globe and Mail, Canada's national newspaper, bought the photograph, cropped it, put it on the front page of the national sports section, and then they tagged this headline. And a week after that final, we came home from Seoul and we walked into that. Wow, I'll tell you what, as a 24-year-old kid, I was ill-prepared for that moment. The article laid blame, it held nothing back. For the first time in my life, I had experienced shame around sport on a level that I had never seen before. So my strategy at the time was to hide. I took off to Australia, I traveled around for about a year, but this moment was not going away. So I figured the only way to fix it was to go back again and win in 1992 at the Barcelona Games in Seoul. So I returned to Canada and I resumed training. In fact, I used this photograph every morning before practice, afternoon before practice, evening before bed. And I'd look at that picture and I would remember. And the rage and the anger that would boil up, oh my, it was unbelievable. But wow, was that an effective source for training. Powerful. Revenge and retribution were the ticket, right? But as we, some of us might know, revenge, retribution, powerful motivator, it's got a short fuse. And mine blew up after about six months. I retired from rowing and began a phase that we now refer to as athlete transition. At the time, we didn't even have a name for it because we didn't talk about it which kind of compounded it because not only was I going through this experience, but I thought there was something wrong with me for going through this experience. The experience can go the whole gamut. Rage, loss of identity, loss of purpose, anxiety, depression, eating disorder, addiction, suicide. I stopped at the addiction. Thanks. It was a rough go. In 1994, I was a few years into it, and I had sort of hit the proverbial rock bottom, and I was starting to crawl back up. And a friend of mine who lived in Victoria, I was living in Vancouver, she called me up and said, you know what, Jason, I just think you need a good old-fashioned blind date. <laughs> and, um, you know, I thought that was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard of, right? I mean, I was having a hard enough time hanging out with myself, let alone another woman. But she was insistent. And so I listened, and she described her again. But this time she added that she was a member of the Canadian National Women's Running Team, right? She was a runner. And that was intriguing for me. Because every middle distance runner that I had met up until that moment was bold, and strong, and confident, didn't take crap from anybody, 
They were on purpose. In reflection, she was everything that I wasn't. And I wanted to meet her. So we did. On a beach in Victoria, Caddy Bay, mid-July, beautiful day. Now, I was pretty uber competitive, right? But um, I wasn't stupid, so I thought, well, Jace, right out of the gates, your question can't be about running, right? Especially about a race that's coming up. Robin, was, this woman, was a member of the Canadian national team racing at the Commonwealth Games in 1994. Victoria was hosting those games. And she had the final of the women's 3,000 meters coming up in about a week, right? So I knew about the race. Anytime I knew about a race, the next question was invariably, how are you going to do, right? Are you going to win this thing or what? So I thought, well, let's just wait a bit, right? Let's just talk about normal stuff. So three hours later, we're still yakking, and I haven't asked my question yet. So finally, I just came out with it. Now, at the time, I had a description of what I would have considered an acceptable, possibly even normal answer. And the answer that I got was anything but. She said that she was going to go out in the race and just do her best, right? Her best. And, and then just see what happened. At the time, I, I was embarrassed for her. I just thought, wow, you're a national team runner, and you're going to go do your best? I, I mean, it's, it's one thing to think it, but you don't tell anybody that, right? <laughs> but then it got worse. She then went on to say that the reason she was just going to do her best was because she had struggled with some illness through the winter and spring. She had some challenges with her immune system, and so her training was on again, off again. And that she wasn't feeling prepared. She wasn't fit, wasn't ready. But she still felt that she should go out and see where she is in her training. And I thought, wow, of all the reasons to not race, you've just named a few. <laughs> what are you doing? A week later, it's the day of the race. And I had already bought my ticket before the date. Dutch, Scottish heritage, I wasn't giving that ticket away, right? I was going to go watch that race and use that ticket. So I went over to Victoria, showed up at the stadium, found my seat just as the starter sent the runners off. No surprise, all the top international runners were gone. Top Kenyans, Canadians, Australians, Brits. And this particular woman, she was gone too, right? But but unfortunately gone to the back of the pack. In fact, tied for last on the opening laps. Here she is about third from your left with the red hair. Hint, hint. So, at which point I'm kind of thinking, you know what, if there was ever a moment to step off the track and DQ, now would be the time, right? Because this is going to end really badly and this is going to be embarrassing. And why would you self-inflict that? But she kept going. And five laps into the race, we now have two groups running. We've got a lead group, all the top runners. 50 meters back, easily, we have the second group. And in that group, we have this one. With four laps to go, for whatever reason, she decided now would be a good time to pass somebody, right? So I think to myself, okay, I mean, fair enough, right? Second group can have their own little race, right? <laughs> kind of cute more than anything. But she didn't stop there. She passed another runner, and then another runner, and another, until eventually this happened. And in that following group behind the two Kenyans, Leah Fells and Robin Moore, and they've got to start making a decision as to whether they're going to go after the Kenyans. And as I speak, Robin Moore is making that decision and he's running up on Alison Wyatt's shoulder. So it's Angela Chalmers, the two Kenyans, Alison Wyatt, Robin Moore. And, and Robin Moore is looking very strong, running in third. 
place behind Alison Wyatt. 50 metres to go for Angela Chalmers of Canada, and it's going to be a battle between Alison Wyatt and Robin Marr, who's now moved into second place with it, 400 metres to go. Well, and the Bell's following too. It could be gold and silver for Canada if Robin Marr can hold on. A brilliant repeat of all situation. So as I stood in that stadium, and I was watching this now famous victory lap, and I will admit with some tears in my eyes and a lump in my throat, but not because of the date, not because I knew her, but instead because I had just witnessed this incredible display of the human spirit, right? This willingness to go really hard. A little late, mind you, but, but it was still impressive. But the question remained for me, how? Because I knew the context of the race. I knew that she was ill-prepared. I knew she hadn't trained fully. And she had this, this really weak strategy going into the race <laughs> to do her best. <laughs> and so the question was, how do you put that together and come out with a silver medal against some of the top runners in the world? How is that possible? The first time I saw this photograph, it's a beautiful photograph. I thought it was where the team had got a photographer and they'd done these little run-bys, right? Sort of like for a sponsor or something. I don't know, like a like a hair product. <laughs> and then I found out that this photograph was taken two laps from the finish line of the race we've just watched. Now, I've never had a photograph of me taken with 500 meters to go in the race, but I'll tell you what. If I ever looked like that, I'd want the photograph destroyed. Along with the negative. Because that is not the face of a competitor. Not in my world, right? She doesn't look mean. Doesn't look exhausted. Doesn't look like she's trying to kill anyone. That's beautiful. It's graceful. How does that go with high performance? Well, what I've kind of figured out over these years is that Robin ran simply for a different reason than I would. For Robin, it was all about journey, and she was journey-centric. And her motivation came from an intrinsic place, came from inside. And the interesting thing about intrinsic motivation is that it's grounded in love. Love is what lights intrinsic motivation. So, the byproduct of that love well, it's a resume that I could have lived with. Two Olympic Games, Commonwealth Games, 
silver medalist, World Cup silver medalist, repeated top 10 world ranking for 17 years on the national team. That's crazy. An inspiring exit. I don't have time to get into that now. Happy to answer on the weekend. And then she ran her fastest times in the last part of her career. So that love continued to sustain her motivation. So when you talk about love in performance, right, with coaches, especially the kind I used to hang on, you know, it's, phew, really? Come on, Jace, love? Yeah, love. In terms of motivation, what does science have to say about it? Well, let's have a look at that. There are four levels of motivation that we react to. And the first one is reward. When there's something in it for us, it can inspire performance and it is somewhat sustainable. But clearly you can see there's room for improvement. The second one is when it's about reputation. When it's our reputation on the line compared to somebody else. More inspiring around performance, more sustainable, but room for improvement. The third one is about mastery, self-mastery. <coughs> Getting better. And Robin and I see that all the time with our 13-year-old daughter when she's practicing her piano. She'll be struggling with a new piece, struggling, 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 and then, boom, I almost got it. And in that moment of almost getting it, she doesn't get up and walk away from the piano and say, oh, almost got it. That's good enough. No, she digs in deeper because she loves the feeling of getting better. We are hardwired to experience that. We never get tired of improvement. The fourth one is service, contributing to the greater good, right? Charities rely on this. Without that, they'd be in trouble. Again, it is innate for us to want to contribute to something bigger than us. If you've ever worked at a soup kitchen, not being paid, it's a pretty cool feeling, a feeling you want to replicate. So essentially, there are four levels of motivation. And when we rank them, we, they show up like this. And the research around this, perhaps no surprise, is grounded in economics, in business. Studies were done in MIT, London School of Economics, because companies wanted to know how do we motivate our employees. But the research isn't consistent with how we behave. What they found in those studies was that if you take groups and you incentivize them, something happens that doesn't necessarily add up to the way we think it should add up. When the task is simple, put widgets in boxes. For every widget in that box, you get more money. Incentivizing works. As soon as you add a component to the task that requires some form of cognitive activity, something that's creative, a thought process. Everything changes. So in these studies, they had three groups. First group, no, didn't get paid anything. Second group got paid a little. Third group got paid the most. They gave them the task. They timed how long it took them to do it. The, t the group that took the longest to do it was the group that, got, that were going to get paid the most. Incentivizing people gets in the way of our ability to think creatively in the moment and go through process. Can you draw on that and put it on top of, the, on top of sports? I think so. We refer to it as a chunk. <coughs> we think these line up into two categories. The second one, the bottom two, speak to your ego. And that's not a bad thing. Don't misinterpret that, right? Chasing a reward or trying to work on your reputation, nothing wrong with that. It motivates people. Hell, the bottom two, they got me into an Olympic final. But they got in the way in that Olympic final. 
The top two, they resonate in our soul, for lack of a better term, inside of us. We feel it on a deeper level. Essentially, we're talking about intrinsic motivation, extrinsic motivation. Both forms work. We like to think one works better. Now, when we talk about love, it, has, it lands on people in different ways, understandably, right? So what we've done is come up with a way to try and quantify love, to give it value. And we're going to play along at home today. We refer to it as our love score. And there are four categories, and we'd like you to answer these questions. With pen or pencil to paper, if you don't have that, put it in your phone, right? It's not enough to just have a fleeting thought. Oh, yeah, I think I'd score myself this. You want the number to look back at you. Okay, I'm going to ask the questions quickly. Don't think about it. Let the truth answer the question. Okay, ready? First category. Out of ten, how would you rank your love for self? Out of ten. Oh, sorry. You are not going to read these out. <laughs> so, this is between you and yourself. Thank you. I'm not going to share this. Second one, the endeavor. So, in this instance, let's reference sport. Okay, that's why we're here. How much do you love what you do within sport? As a coach, as an athlete, as an administrator, as a parent? Choose a category. How much do you love what you do? Out of ten. Third one, how much do you love your team? If you're an athlete, how much do you love the, people, the guys on your team, the women on your team? How much do you love your coach? If you're a coach, how much do you love your athletes? How much do you love your other coaches? Out of ten. And the fourth one, and this one raises some eyebrows. For sure, it did for me. How much do you love the people you compete against? Out of ten. Your competitors. Tally it all up. Scores out of 40. Now, the interesting thing about this score is that I think we could all agree that at some point in our lives, most of us in here probably had a perfect score. And then these really interesting creatures showed up in our lives, called adults. <laughs> and they showed up as parents, as aunts and uncles, as neighbors, teachers, coaches. And they started to share their thinking with us. They started to share their teaching, their thoughts, their beliefs, their stories. And we were children. And so we trusted them. Well, it's coming from an adult. I trust them. It must be true. And then we began to take it on. Their teaching, their thoughts, their beliefs, their stories. And in that moment, our score began If I were to go back and do this score, backing into those starting gates, 21 maybe, maybe. In my bid for 92, probably a six. Zero, zero, three on a good day, two on a good day, two, three on a good day. Every number short of 40 is an interference. Interference gets in the way. Every number short of 40 gets in the way of our ability to perform. Strategy, technique, fitness, diet, mindfulness practices, all of it goes through the gatekeeper. This is the gatekeeper. Of all the things we have to do as coaches, this is one of them. 
we have to improve our score. Because even though we didn't share, we always share, right? We smell like our score. <laughs> we drop indicators and hints all the time. And our athletes smell it. Of all of your bag of tools that you have to work on as a coach, I would add this one. And I would give it the most amount of room. The sad thing about this is that the athletes that I've worked with personally, national team, aspiring national team athletes, who have accomplished incredible things, who one might consider would be high-functioning people, none of them have ever scored over 20. That's learned. That's learned. That's why we like to believe that coaching isn't a job. It's a privilege. It's a privilege to have the power of this influence over the young lives that we touch. Tim Galway, fascinating guy, inner game of tennis, inner game of golf, inner game of work, I'm not going to get into him, Google him. <laughs> he has a really cool um, equation around performance. Performance equals potential minus interference. All things being perfect, our performance should equal all the preparation that we do leading up to that performance. The trouble is, it doesn't work that way because we show up and we create interferences and we get in our own way and we undo all of the potential. So our job as coaches in working with athletes is to try to minimize that interference, as much as it is to build the potential of our athletes. Both equally important. Otherwise, you're just one step forward, <laughs> one or two back. The motivation equation, if we were to look at it in a traditional sense, the traditional paradigm, for lack of a better expression, would be, we might look like this, okay? Athlete plus an active coach equals motivation. When I first started coaching, this is certainly what I bought into. It was my role to motivate my athletes. And I think the traditional sense of it, certainly Hollywood depicts it as such, right? A good coach kicks garbage cans, throws hockey sticks, swears on the sideline. That's a coach, right? I mean, come on. It's our job to motivate these athletes. But what if, what if you took the coach out of the equation? And what if in doing that, you empowered the athlete to be responsible for their own motivation, and in doing so, created more powerful, more sustainable motivation? Part of the challenge around that is that the first equation for some coaches is more fun. I want to be that guy. I want to be in the spotlight. I want, to, I want people to think it was my job and I'm the reason they got that good. But in order to step into the second line, you have to come to the realization that it's not about me. It's about my athletes. Not always an easy revelation for some. Right? Guilty as charged. When I first started coaching, I was the top line, I like add coach about 50 times, and that's me. It was my job to inspire athletes, and I used some frightening tactics to do so. Why? Because that's what Neil taught me. We change when we have a reason to change. When I met Robin, when I lost in soul, when I went through what I went through, I had a really good reason to change. Quick story. When I went back uh, for my last coaching job in St. Catharines, Ontario, believe it or not, I went back to my old school, my high school, alumni, and I got hired to sort of help out with the program. And when I got there, we had done some cool stuff at a school on the west coast on Vancouver Island called Shawnigan Lake School. So when I got to Ridley, you know, there was, a, a, there was an expectation. And so a number of athletes 
transferred to the school because they wanted to row for the school. And the reason they came to the school was because they wanted to win a national championship. They wanted a gold medal. They wanted their name on the Calder Cleland, the most expensive trophy in all of Canada. And their parents wanted them to win scholarships to the U.S. So when they showed up, it was all about them, right? I get it. I get it. So we met 2010. I gathered together all these 16, 17-year-old boys, big boys. And I said, I understand why you're here. I do. But my job is not to focus on that. My job is to create a culture of love. 16, 17-year-old boys. <laughs> It's my job over the next two years to help you learn how to love each other. And, yeah, okay, there was some raised eyebrows, right? I mean, who's this flake from the West Coast? What is this love stuff, right? It's not why I came here. I came here because I heard that you made people work really hard and you won race. So, fast forward two years, they were a fast group. They were a fast group. In fact, at the national championships, they won the championship race, they got their gold medal, they got their names on that trophy, and they set a Canadian record which still stands today. So they got all the tangible things, and then a truckload of them got scholarships to the U.S. Okay, Merry Christmas. <laughs> but for me, my moment came the next morning, when the local newspaper showed up, and I was reading the article, picture them on the front page, Blah, 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 blah. They asked the coxie of the crew, what makes these guys so fast? And her answer, beautiful. There's a lot of love in this boat. Buckets, right? Like, that was it. Niagara Falls. I was done. <laughs> That's all I needed. I had done my job. I had showed, helped facilitate teenage boys in how to love other teenage boys and not have it be creepy. <laughs> <laughs> the result of that was some pretty cool stuff. But my job was to teach them how to love, work on their love score. What we believe, when love is the foundation of who we are and what we do, not only do we set ourselves up for extraordinary success but a life brimming with happiness and fulfillment. It's, uh, I can't argue. I can't. Even if I wanted to. Right? Even if that old guy were to get up, not old, I guess younger, even if he were to come up here right now and question, I'd just say, look, I can't go back to that way. Because it, it's limited. I mean, it works. It works enough. But it doesn't work as well as it could. And that's what I'm interested in. <laughs> Love that picture. <laughs> Closer to Quasimodo than the other photographs. <laughs> Could you put the love quote back in? Just for you bet. Let me know when you've got it and I'll just and we'll uh, throw that lovely photograph back up. But I didn't mean to begin. Yeah. <laughs> so I had my own journey with arriving to the place that we're talking about. I grew up on the east coast of Nova Scotia, number seven of nine, and sometimes getting to the bathroom in the morning was a big competition. So. I grew up in a very competitive environment where achievement, doing your best, was emphasized. But I had embraced the traditional values of going for it and excellence. And there were a number of steps along that journey that just kept inviting me in a certain direction. And one of those was, I was 12 when I started competing on a national level. And 
once I got a lot of publicity, I noticed adults started treating me differently. And the message from that was, what was wrong with me before? I didn't want my sense of who I was as a human being to hinge on my performances. So I distanced myself from my identity as a competitor and wanted to have a really clear sense of who I was and why I engaged in what I did that had a sense of inner freedom from that. I didn't want to feel like what I did had my value wrapped in it. And so identity was a real key piece in that journey of what am I about, what do I care about. And in quiet moments on the rocks when I moved to the west coast in Victoria, when I was in a place of just sitting there, there was something in me that wanted to be a force for goodness, and that was my truth. And I wanted to honor that. And I was very sensitive as a young person, and I wanted to feel like I could be my own person. And so I felt like the rock that I had to stand on was knowing who I was and what I cared about. And if I could live aligned with that, then I would have the freedom to live life on my terms. And I kept getting invited to a theme about relationship. I remember I was, after my first year of university, I went home for a visit and my sister was in nursing school and she had women's ways of knowing. knowing. Anybody ever hear of that book? Yeah. So it was such a, a moment for me to read about the dominant cultural values of strength and independence that I had, I had embraced those values and I had rejected the part of me that was more relationally focused. But reading about that, there was something that happened and it just allowed me to drop more into my relational self and it felt like a freedom to do that. And then that just kept showing up. I remember taking a course on relationships in my early 20s and there was a part on the science of the brain that talked about there's a part of us that doesn't differentiate between self and others. And it was another moment of, oh, that's why the golden rule, it feels better to do unto others as I would want to have to do unto myself. And the more I focused on expanding my circle of care, where I was included and everybody I included in my circle of care, it felt more, life felt fuller, it just felt better. So, that theme just kept showing up again and again. But when I would step into competition sometimes and feel afraid of what the other competitors would, would uh, take away from me, I felt myself contracted and small. I felt tight and I couldn't compete as freely. And it took the fun of it. It really wasn't fun to be have your stomach in knots and to be anxious stepping up to the line and to feel like you could be judged by how you did. So there was a lot of searching in that process to find a way to inner freedom. And there were more bumps and more ups and more downs after the 92 Olympics. I had a great season in Europe and came home, took a break and wanted to get ready to train again but I kept getting sick and a sports medicine doctor said based on my blood profile and what was going on in January of 94 that it could take years to get back to international competition. So I decided at that time, I didn't, given the outcome was going to be uncertain, I just wanted to make the most of every day to get out there with an intention to just embrace the moment, to be grounded in my body, and especially when I was out on the trails, to just take in that beauty. And the gift that was waiting for me in that process and that journey was huge. So stepping into a place of uncertainty and unknowing, I just and just learning to be present in my body, it was a profound awakening for that process to be a gift in itself. And all kinds of healing happened in that time. So when I stepped into the Commonwealth Stadium, just being open to the possibilities. I open to what could be in a place of trust and letting go. And feeling the connection to the crowd in that space and allowing that connection to just flow through me. Life was happening through me in that moment. 
and I got out of the way. And that was such a profound teaching, that whole process of learning how to nourish my body with food and be in the moment took me into a place of deep discovery. And the richness and the joy that I felt in that process, that was the gift that I wanted to continue to explore and discover. That, that younger self that felt tight and contracted with knots in her stomach, when we, a benchmark for us is our 13-year-old daughter. We've both been in sport for a long time, and we want her to have a ha happy, healthy sense of herself, to be grounded in her body, and to be awake and aware of her, and to have a sense of her gifts. And that's a beautiful thing, it's a powerful thing. So when we step into that place, life is really juicy and fun. And that's something that we really want people to embrace as a part of a rich life. And it's not always that way in sports, so it can be challenging to be in environments that have different needles. And so for us, cultivating that culture, and for me, that theme of relationship that just kept building, I had a passion for health, but what kept coming up was the primacy of relationship to health and well-being. Across every measure of health and well-being, across the lifetime, having people that you feel care about you, that you feel connected to, is the biggest predictor of health and well-being. And so, I, I went on to study somatic psychotherapy and did relationship training. And understanding how to work with this instrument in an embodied way and in a relational way because I, I then began to understand the science and how we could more purposefully help people connect to that inner place, that heart space. And sometimes relationships don't feel like a safe place for us, so we can go to other places like the beautiful dog that's on the floor there. For me, there were times when it was so stressful being in competitive environments that connecting to the trees and my dog were a safer place if I was in a high stress state. Sometimes there people weren't available. So there's a lot of different directions we can go with this information. But I want to pause for a moment and just see where you are on your edges of what we're talking about and how you're trying to more fully come to your level of full performance in your life. Any burning questions? Any? Yes? Uh, yeah, just now you uh, two three minutes ago, you said you had a parent while you were running that life was happening through you. Yes. Could you expand on that? Also, what, what led you to that realization you that? How, how did you come to that? Yes. Um, it was a humbling space to be in, and it was about connecting to intention, to open up and be in the moment. So the qualitative difference of feeling the sense of, I'm going to create something, versus a sense of open space internally, where I'm open to the possibilities, but in a heart space of deep connection. There's a, a flow in the experience where I, in, in that experience, I felt like a part of a bigger process. Life was happening through me. It wasn't just my small sense of self directing something. It was a creative engagement and a dance where there was a bigger sense of flow and possibility. And it felt like it, it was grounded in a heart space of being connected and supported. And so there is a lot of possibility, but there is a very different sense to that than a sense of I'm going to get in there and kick butt and make things happen in a way that feels tighter and it feels more willful, but it feels like a space of less possibility. And so part of my practice of wanting to, the part of my practice was spurred on by having moments of waking up in a hospital in my first year of university. Um, I had got hit by a car and woke up in a hospital and I thought, wow, what if that was it? What if the life never went on again? 
what am I here for and what do I want my life to be about? And continually coming back to intention and my best moments, the practice of that quiet time on the trails in nature where I just focused on my body and my breath moving back and forth between that and the beauty around me. It expanded my sense of self, moving into that connected space where energy rose up through me and my heart space felt huge and out of that a sense of connection to the earth and the gratitude for how it fed and sustained me and how beautiful it is and to be in the moment and feel that and to the people that I met that I wanted that energy to come through me and I just felt like I see you, I feel you and I'm glad we're here together. It felt like a beautiful space to occupy as a way of living. And I wanted that gift to infuse how I competed in sport. And sometimes that felt really hard because my own fears and an environment that didn't feel safe triggered me. And I would move into that smaller space. And so the practice became, how do I move into that space? Because life feels really rich and beautiful in this space. And I want to honor you and celebrate life. And what I could do in my training from that space, it, it was so much more powerful than that athlete that was really gutty and hard, but tight. Because, yes, I could gear down and go hard. And I knew how to do that as a young athlete. And it got me into chronic fatigue and a compromised immune system. And I was really afraid at a certain point of, I don't have the energy to get out of bed, I keep getting sick. What if this is my future? And so reclaiming my health and coming back to a space of inner freedom and possibility was a really rich part of my journey that I'm grateful I stayed in sport long enough to mature into that space. And then moving into practices with somatic psychotherapy and the whole field of interpersonal neurobiology where we learn that we're fundamentally wired to connect from the time that we're born throughout our lifespan. And through that connection, we learn how to be in that space and expand the possibilities of what we can be together. So helping people to skillfully, deliberately move into that space together is a really rich experience in itself. And it's something we can do every day to help one another be in uh, the kind of world that I, for one, would like to live in would be friendlier and more connected. So I've spoken a lot to that question, but any other thoughts? Yes? Um, you used the word gift. Did it feel like receiving a gift? This, the space in the, the especially the performance of the Commonwealth Games. When I say gift, I felt in that space like life itself is a gift. That being alive is a gift. And it, it evoked a deep sense of reverence for life. So what could happen through me, I felt gratitude, but it felt humbling. And it was humbling because I felt the vastness of life. And it felt like a beautiful gift to be connected to that and in service to that. I wanted to ask, how is the field different, whether you're running privately through a forest or publicly through the state? And, and so the forest was easy for me because some of my early years of competition at a university level, there were traumatic experiences that really overwhelmed me. And the sport arena wasn't a particularly safe place for me. And so one of my ways to cope with that overwhelm when safe people didn't feel like a big part of that container was to go out and get into the forest and to connect with the living system of the earth. And so the... It was harder at times to be in that, safe, in that space, in competitive environments. But what I'll talk about in a few minutes, um, 
learning how to, to do that with people became part of my healing journey as well. Thank you. Spoke about kind of how destructive his acting transition was, um, and I was just thinking about the, the kind of stark contrast between both of your stories in, in comparison of how you went about your athletic endeavors. So I was curious if you might be able to talk a little bit about your transition out of professional sport into what came next, and, and did you face any of the same challenges, or did they still come up even though you had this, this kind of intrinsic gift? Um, yes, so I run almost every day. I love getting out into the forest. And I, I went to graduate school after I finished competing. And so I was in the best shape of my life in 2000. Um, and put some of my fastest times down on the track. And I had pain in my lower back. And then uh, thought I did a warm up, did a few 200 slots, no, I, I, can, I can manage this, and did a blow away workout, and then could hardly walk across the parking lot after that. And I miscalculated, and my Olympics at the peak of my athletic um, development was, was done. I couldn't come back from that. And so, there were tears for me, but it was, I was grateful for what I learned through athletics and what it had taught me, and I wanted to continue to embrace that practice, and I still had lessons to learn around letting go of that, letting go of sport, so there's still pieces of that that even today I work with, but the gift of the practice was something that I treasure and I still take with me. What I realized, there's layers of it. And the part of sport that wasn't healthy for me, part of me, what I didn't realize in that transition was I was still trying to get that performance to even the score of what went so sideways for me in the underbelly of sport. And so that journey had profound lessons as well, and it's more than the space of this time, but relationship and healing around relationship was huge in that. And my training in somatics was a big part of that. And I wish I had known what I knew later and how that would have helped me within the sport of when things weren't so wholesome and healthy. Just like you were expressing, there are so many athletes who push their bodies and, and maybe at the expense of their spirit or other things. And I'm curious, what do you do now to balance that imbalance from back then? Your body, so far, that then what do you do now to help keep your, your body, mind, spirit, and entire being in shape and that Well, one of, one of my processes was in that time, of, early time of intense overwhelm in my first two years of university, one of the ways I tried to cope with that overwhelm was emotional eating. And that was a very despairing place for me. And finding my way out of that was about befriending my body and focusing on nourishing my body. And so my, I always valued health, but the window expanded where I was competing within a window that honored my body. So as a young athlete, I was as hard as you can as intense as you can, and then if you if you go flat, then you pick yourself up and do it again. I learned a different way because I lost my health, and the emotional eating piece was also about finding my way to nourishing my body and being, and being in a relationship, because it felt bad to not do that. There was something that inherently didn't feel good. And so to find freedom again to a place where I learned how to nourish my body and stop and ask, 
What are you really trying to feed here? What do you need to nourish? Again, it was about finding freedom. And it felt like a bigger space to live in to nourish, having the intention to nourish my body on all levels. And so my journey became within a health window in a way that I learned to do that better. And we know better now. We understand more than when I first started. So we owe it to athletes to do it in a way that's physiologically smarter and healthier. And you can get more out of that as well. Yes. So, any, have any of you here heard of Stephen Porges' work and polyvagal theory and the whole field of interpersonal neurobiology? Yes. So, that whole field is quite expansive and it looks at, again, the whole piece of how we're, we're wired to connect with one another and that we, co we learn to regulate our inner life through relationships. And so when we're in, we have a, a certain zone of arousal in our nervous system. And when we're in that optimal space, that optimal zone, then we are more capable of performing better. But when there's too much fear, it bumps us into a hyper-arousal state of either anger or agitation or hyper-vigilance. And if that doesn't if it's the fight-flight mode, and if that doesn't work, then we can collapse into a freeze response, an immobility response, where we feed death. And so, when we're in a zone of optimal arousal, there's sufficient safety to connect with our higher brain circuitry and to perform at our best. Social engagement, the part of our nervous system that picks up whether we feel safe, in danger, or life threat, goes to the body first. The body decides whether we feel safe. If the body doesn't feel safe, then the story that emerges out of that is one of fear, gloom, and doom. If we feel safe in our body, then we naturally move towards possibilities and more expanded thinking, and our perceptions of our environment of our body and our cues are more accurate. So we interact with our environment more skillfully when we're in a state of social engagement and in that optimal zone of arousal. But the biggest element that helps us be in that zone is safe, caring relationship. And if we don't get enough of that, we continue to be motivated in ways that we're trying to protect ourselves compared to being in a place where we're trying to connect with one another and be creative and expansive in what we're doing. So, turning towards one another in ways that we know when we're in a place of safety and well-being and that system is working. A lot of this week weekend is about things that help us get in that zone. What we take in through nourishment helps our body feel safe when we're well nourished. Having time outside in nature, the earth that we evolved with, helps us. But, and being embodied, but learning to be in caring relationship with one another is the biggest card that we've got, and it's what we can give to one another. So this whole weekend is going to be about exploring ways that we can do that. understand our physiology and that when we go into states of anger and agitation or terror or fear and with developmentally they're moving all over the place it's a it's a time of state integration 
when you normalize that your body is trying to help you out, but you want to help it along by certain practices, you can invite them to do things that will support them evolving these capacities. And they're not fully there yet, so they need big adult nervous systems to help them learn how to co-regulate. And when you're in a state of ventral vagal social engagement, when that part of your nervous system is on board and you're a caring presence, you invite them to be in that state. More than any words that you say, what's happening in your body communicates with their nervous system and tells them whether this is a safe place to be. So your presence alone is a teaching to their nervous system and an invitation to be in that state. They may not be able to receive the, the invitation right away, but if you stay there, it's an invitation that can, will eventually bring them on more. Okay. Are you a somatic psychotherapist now? Yes. I work with, I, I'm based in Victoria, but I work with people <coughs> in the wonderful world of technology as well. I just got my master's degree in somatic psychology and I'm in my third year of somatic experience. Wonderful. It, it's a lovely time in terms of understanding stress, trauma, and optimal functioning. To, the work is so filled with hope in terms of understanding that we've got this instrument to work with. But when we know how to work with it skillfully through energetic practices and understanding the nervous system, the beautiful thing, I did training as well in Eden Energy Medicine, and the language of integration or harmony, when the different parts can function the way they're intended and connect with one another, we can function at our optimal state. And energetically, when the different parts are connected and in harmony, we have a higher level of functioning. So they may speak different languages, but they're coming to the same place of interconnected harmony. And so using sport as a vehicle where we, we can come back to that place. For me, the 96 Olympics was a time when I felt a bit of despair about where sport was. The, the Olympic torch was a replica of the McDonald French fry holder. And there were athletes that came from some goats in Kenya to come in and participate in the Olympic Games. And there, was, there were just all kinds of things that happened there that were a glaring example between the disparity between the Olympic ideals and what was happening. And Juan Antonian Samurai, the head of the IOC at the time, was giving his closing ceremony speech and he was a fascist sympathizer. And so I was feeling a bit discouraged about where we were with sport at that time. And then Stevie Wonder stepped on stage and started to play Imagine. And it brought me back to my heart. And I felt like, imagine if this was the spiritual Olympics, and it was about how we can bring out the best in one another and love one another and be connected. That's the journey that I want to take. And that's the journey that I'm going to keep taking. But I don't know where it's going to lead me relative to sport. And I guess ultimately that's our invitation here. How can we explore being at our best together with deeper connection, with celebrating more and having more fun? Because it's a way lot more fun to be in that space and play together than the alternatives. <laughs>